Hello, everyone. 11 minutes uh, late, but uh, um, I think it, it, like this, if it's quiet, it's better. So um, so we are around this place. So we are doing some, uh, so we, uh, construction, destruction, we talked about it. We talked about current object. Uh, to uh, member operators, we kind of touch based, but I want to actually go through it in detail today. So helper function and, and member operators are our focus today. Um, and um, I want to kind of write stuff over there and uh, um, uh, explain to you exactly how uh, binary operators, um, the, uh, the operators work. And, uh, um, uh, we'll see how it's going to um, actually work out. So, when you're dealing, when we are talking about operators, this is not this one. Let me just zoom in a little. There we go. When we are talking about operators, um, we talk about two things. One is, one, oh, that, that's beautiful focus. Amazing. Maybe on video it's going to get better. Or maybe if I zoom out. Okay, let me zoom out. Yeah, that's better. Okay. So, uh, when we are dealing, when we are talking about operators, uh, we talk about two things. We talk about operands and operators. So whenever you are dealing with operators, what you see is something like this. So you actually see something like A and then some operator B. Okay? You have something like this. This we call left operand. This we call right operand. And this is the operator, whatever it may be. You okay with this? This is a binary operator. It doesn't mean that it acts, acts binary stuff. We call it binary because you have two, uh, two operands. Unary operators work like this. So example for this one is 2 plus 5. OK? <laughs> right? And when we are dealing with operators, talking about operators with uh, um, uh, uh, unary operators, it's essentially something like this. You have either something like this which is minus A plus B, not C, right? And we have only one type of a postfix unary operator that takes form like this. So we can have B and then write uh, the operator after, which is essentially B plus plus and uh, um, C minus minus. Okay, for unary operators, we can have plus plus A2. Okay, so these are the types of operators that we have. So either unary or uh, binary. Uh, when we were dealing with strings, when we actually talked about strings, um, I, uh, for the example that I use for strings, I overloaded a few operators and I showed you how it works, how we can actually uh, make our code uh, access objects and redefine operators for them. The action of operator overloading is very important for you to understand, means that you already have an operator with a behavior. You want to change that behavior. You cannot create a new operator. Operators are only overloaded. We need to understand that. So you cannot create an operator out of the blue and say, I want to create a new operator. It doesn't work that way. It must already exist. But for what you have, for the objects that you have, for its operands, it's not defined. Therefore, you define that operator to work with the objects that you want. OK? Now, we talked about operators as member functions. So essentially, we said, Whenever you are dealing with an operator, you got to look at it this way. So 
we said if you have A operator B, what we see is essentially A dot operator, whatever the operator is, and it accepts a B. So this operator to be defined, this function must get created. That's what we essentially show, right? Are we okay with this? And these were all member operators, which essentially means we had some kind of a type for this. So we had the class foo for A. So foo essentially is the class for A. So somewhere you have class foo. And in this foo, you had an operator created. So you had operator, whatever it was, that accept, accepted the other type, whatever the type B is, fa B. And whatever this returns, we'll find out what it is. So the return type is exactly like a function. It doesn't make any difference. So what you need to understand over here is that what we dealt with right now are only member operators, OK? So that was the example that I gave you. I'm going to go through it one more time uh, with the example that we had so we can actually see uh, what we created. Take a look at the, uh, uh, the sample that we created as a review, and then I'm going to continue after that. Uh, so essentially, um, what I did, I created a, a dynamic string. We said that we're going to create a dynamic string, and the dynamic string that we are going to create, this is from last session. Um, we wanted to replace the strings that we have for C language, so it's going to be kind of foolproof, and it, doesn't, it won't crash on us, so I don't have to worry about the length and stuff. Therefore, I created the string with a default constructor that sets up. Let me just uh, split the window so we can actually see how things work with a quick review over it. And if there is any um, question or anything that, sh that you think that you're lost and you, do you cannot follow, stop me, so I'll explain it, OK? So we said that uh, we create a default constructor. And we said default constructors are called whenever the object is created by default, which means nothing is provided for it. So essentially, if I have over here include string.h. And of course, my string.h is in namespace sds. So I'm going to say using namespace sdds and int main return 0. And then in here, if I actually say uh, string s, it means I want to have an empty string with nothing in it. Therefore, the default constructor will be called, and the default constructor will set my class to be an empty thing. And we always said whenever you are having a process, I mean, in, in your pro uh, that, that, that process getting reused over and over, if you're writing a code and you see, oh, I have to write that logic again, as soon as you see that, stop, package that log logic in a private function and recall the private function. Do not keep writing the logic over and over for two reasons. Number one, you don't want to write too much code. You just want to be done with your program and be done with it. That's number one. You, because we are lazy, that's number one, which is a good reason. Number two is that when you have the same logic repeated in five different places, if two weeks from now you notice that the logic that you have needs modification for any reason, then you have to go through this daunting task of trying to find out where you have used that logic to check, change every single one of them. Therefore, if you actually packaged everything into a private function, then you could go over there, change one function, and it applies to all the things that it's, that is changed. Set empty is one of those things that it comes pretty handy. And how do I set empty? I set my uh, uh, pointer to null, and I set my uh, size to zero. Uh, the, the, another way to create a string is to actually set the string to something. So I'm going to have 
string r and I'm going to set that one to hello. So if I do something like this, as we mentioned, assignment at the moment of creation is what? It's initialization. And initialization is? Is what? No, it's not. That's exactly what I said. It is not an assignment. Initialization at the moment of creation is what? I screamed loud. Remember, I went bananas and I said, an assignment at the moment of creation is? Somebody said it. A constructor. A call to a constructor. What constructor? The constructor that accepts that argument. What is that argument? It's a string. A string is a constant character pointer. Therefore, line number 11 in the header file is what is going to get called. Assignment at the moment of creation is not an assignment. It's initialization, and therefore it's a call to a constructor with the exact same argument. Remember this. This is an extremely important thing to remember. And because of that fact, I'm just going to put it right now in the questions that I'm going to ask on Friday in your lab. So let me just go over here and sandbox. When I say assignment at the moment of creation is a call to a constructor, it means essentially this constructor will be called and hello will be passed to the string. That's what's going to happen. And then in this string, the function operator equal will be called, therefore setting my object to whatever is supposed to get set. So because I have a set function over here, I can actually use that set function. Do I have a set function? It's, it's going to be easier. Let me just do it that way. So do I have a set? Yes, I do have a set function. So in here, I'm going to say if the string is not null, which means the person actually provided something for me, then set the string to whatever it's supposed to be. And when I go to the set function, I'll see that in set function, the memory is cleared. Again, it's something that is need to be done. So essentially, because it's setting the object to whatever it is, it goes and clears the memory. I want to bring that function up. It clears the memory, sets the data to null, sets the size to null, which means it wipes out everything that was there already. And then after that, it's going to find out what is the size. And then it's going to allocate enough memory for that size adding a plus after for null termination, setting uh, the data. And on purpose, I put the same name over here, which I'm not going to put now. So I'm going to actually make it right. I mentioned over here why um, we start all the variables with M underline. So, so this conflict won't happen. So therefore, I remove this and this one and this one so I can comfortably remove all these and it becomes much more clear now. If you want to know what I did, go check the notes for, for the previous day. Okay? So I am setting the data, clearing the memory, see what is the length of data, keep it in the size, allocate enough memory for that uh, in M data and copy everything to M data. And that's what setting does. So that's essentially the constructor that is being called. Now, what happens if I actually do this now? If I say S is set to how are you? If I do something like this, this assignment is not at the moment of creation. Therefore, the assignment operator will be called, the one that we just discussed. So this essentially means that the function operator equal is called with how are you in it. So line number six and seven are identical. Lines number six and seven are identical. Are we okay with this? Lines number six and seven are identical. Any problem with that? Lines number six and seven are identical. Essentially, yes. 
No, I just wrote you to show you they're identical. OK. So well, we, nobody ever calls it like this. We learned how to overload the operator so not to call a function. Although we can manually call the function, but we don't do it. OK, I just want you to know what is called when you have an operator. So when you have an operator between two objects, you always take a look at the left objects class and see if that operator exists over there. So if I had something like this, if I had s plus high, and I had something like this over here, just for the heck of it. If I have something like this over here, what are the operators I need to look for? Two operators I need to look for. Operator number one is plus, which means I have to look for the class of S, which is a string, to see if it has, a, has an operator plus that accepts a constant character pointer. And then whatever that returns, should work with an assignment operator with R. So there are two operators over here. Essentially, if I translate this to the operator call that I was mentioning, this should be R dot, R dot operator equal, and in here, S dot operator plus, and I have high over here. So the function translation operator So the function translation with, for what you see over here is written over here. All right? That's another good question. So I'm going to give you some kind of an operator thing. I'm going to say translate this into function call. OK? Write the function call version of this. So that's another good question. Let me just over here. Uh, write the function equivalent, function call equivalent, of an operator. And this is not something that you shouldn't be able to do. If you want to be able to write C++, you should recognize that like that. Because when you see it, you, should, you need to immediately know what is being called. So that's essentially what it's going to be. That's the uh, equivalent for that one. So I'm going to write it like this so we know that these two are identical. Are we OK down to here? Are we okay? Yes. Fourteen and sixteen. Line number fourteen and sixteen. Why do we pass the string as a constant? There's no way to actually modify that later or access access that address where the string is. Mm. I mean, why does it have to be a constant? Because it's something that is being copied from. When you get your friend's note to Xerox it, you need to change your friend's note. It has to be constant, which means you don't want to change your friend's note. You just want to copy it. That's what essentially means. It means that my line number 16, for example, it says that the string that is coming in, I am not going to modify it. I'm just going to make a copy and make my string be exactly like that. Exactly. That's, that's my version of saying don't shoot yourself in the foot. You don't want to borrow somebody's note and then mistakenly change it and give it back to the person. That's exactly what it is. And it's the exact same thing with the copy constructor at line. We don't have a copy constructor here. Oh, you don't even know what is a copy constructor. My apologies. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
forget it, forget it, forget it. OK. Just backspace to what I just told you. It's, it's a little later. OK, yes. Vicky, sure, of course. The next thing that I want to talk, so this is, this is member operators that we talked about. We only taught you how to write binary operators. That's the only thing we know. You don't even know how unary operators are written. So I'm not going to talk about it yet. Before, before that, I'm going to talk about this specific type of concept that I want you to understand. These concepts are called helper functions. And I want you to know what a, a helper function is. First, I'll tell you what it is, and it needs for you a little more experience, a little further ahead to go and study and do a little bit of these helper functions to see when they are needed. Okay? Helper functions are essentially functions that are not member of a class, but they help you with something in that class. Make things happening in that class. I'm going to write you a helper function, which is not actually a good thing. But I'm just going to write you for you to see what it is, OK? A helper function, for example. Let's say I want to have a function. You see operator plus that I have written over here? What is this operator plus doing? Operator plus is essentially concatenating two strings, correct? It's actually getting the value of one string and adding it to the current string. What if you want to have two strings, concatenate them, but don't change any of them? I have a name and a last name, and now, now I want to have a full name. I want full name to be the product of first name attached to last name. If I want to do something like this, a helper function seems to be a good solution. OK? For now. But later on, you're going to see most of the helper functions can be avoided. OK? Again, helper functions, listen to me carefully, has helper functions are functions written to help you do something with a class. And they are not member of the class. They are standalone functions. They, from the object-oriented point of view, they are not a good idea. And they should be avoided if possible. So you shouldn't get used to write helper functions unless you have no way. And that, the helper function is the only way to do it. I'm going to demonstrate both of, you, both of them to you today. Number one, I'm going to write a function, and I'm going to call it concatenate or concat, OK? And these, this function of mine will receive two string, and it's going to make a string out of this thing and send it out, OK? Uh, That's going to cause trouble. Let me pause. Before we talk about, before we talk about member functions, uh, helper functions, that we understood what it is. So essentially, they're standalone functions that they work with classes, and they help you do something with the class. Before doing that, to be able to give you an example that makes sense, I need to teach you a new concept. OK, and what is that concept? So 0, 1, operator calls. Uh, 
let me add IO stream over here that I'm going to All right, so uh, I, want you to, I want you to write a piece of IPC144 second week code, and but put my 244 hat on and analyze it. And I want your attention on this, please, okay? Let's say I have a function called print. And in here I'm writing integer A, and I'm going to say over here, C out A. What is the function print doing? It's receiving, oh, it's receiving an integer and it's printing it. Are we okay with this? Now in here, I'm going to write integer val set to 10, and I'm going to say print val. It couldn't be simpler than this. We want to analyze and see what happens over here when I actually write this code. What this code means and what, what will it do? So, how many integers this program has? Program, not function. The whole entire program, how many integers does it have? How many integer it's, it's, def it's defined? How many integer variables you see in there? Why you say there's no trick question? It's two. One and two. One is called A, that is in print. So print is creating an integer variable. That variable is a special variable. It's an argument, which means an argument in a function essentially is a variable that gets initialized when the function is called, okay? And the second variable that I have is integer val that I initialize it to 10. Now, when function call at line 12 is called, when you actually pass val to print, what happens? It goes to line 6. It creates a new integer called a and initializes it to val right away. Therefore, it will copy the value 10. Are we okay with this? Any problem with this? I don't think there is any problem. We understand exactly what happened, right? Fantastic. So we have no problem with this. So essentially, this is what happened. This is my integer val, and it had the value 10 in it, correct? Then in function print, when function was called, an integer got created called a. The value 10 was copied into it, correct? And then it got printed. And when print ended, what happens to a? When print ends, what happens to a? Let me go back in here. When this print ends, what happens to A? A dies, correct? Any problem with that? No problem, right? Are we okay? All right. Now, see what I am going to do. And I want you to follow the walkthrough with me with all your, please set aside all your computers that you're typing on it, text messages and stuff. If you don't get it now, you're going to be in trouble later. This is a very important moment, okay, that we want to walk through. So now what I'm going to do is to write the exact same function again, overload that function, but with another object. 
in here I'm going to say void print string s and simply say s dot print right and see out in here I'm going to create a string and we are going to walk through this together and I want your attention okay string s and this string I, and um, I will see if I can actually have them both at the same time so you can see the screen at the same time uh, I'll do the walkthrough so that's gonna be I'm gonna put over here high and then in here I'm gonna say print uh, s through overloading we know that they are called perfectly correct are we okay with this any problem down to here now let me pause for a second so when the code over here is actually saying print int val we know exactly what happens right so this is my main right in here I have an integer called val correct and then I have a string called s correct are we okay with this what I want you to pay attention to this that string is one sneaky little thing take a look at it it has a character pointer m data and a size so essentially this is my data I always write my pointers as a circle and values as a square and this is the size in it correct I don't want to go walk through walk through we know how this string works so I'm gonna walk through the through the main and tell you exactly how it's going to happen to show you exactly what is wrong okay what's gonna happen that's gonna cause trouble okay so at line 18 print val is called correct so the function print will be called that accepts an integer correct print oh my god print and that print has a val inside correct that val will take the 10 correct and this is the output so 10 is going to get printed over here val print ends val dies correct it comes to line 19 my string that is set to high how does it sh how does it actually point to high this is how it works high is two characters right so the size will be over here too correct but high is not kept there that's a pointer correct so what it's going to do somewhere in memory it's gonna have a high with a null at the end and that's gonna point to it correct are we okay with this now take a look at this now the function print for string is called and that function has print over here and inside print it has the string s correct inside that string s it has two variables one pointer that is data and the other one that is that is the integer right now s is being passed it's line it's line 18 s from main is being passed to s in print correct so it's going to copy all the content of s into the content of s in print correct you mind if i change the name of the s in print so i can actually refer it to a different thing if you don't mind i'm just going to call this t instead of s so I can say S and T so I don't have to say S in this one and S in that one so let, let me rename this one so the print that I have over here has the object string and the name of the thing is T okay now when the function is called in here what happens 
it passes S to T, and T will copy all the content of S, correct? Now, 2, we have no problem. 2 will get copied in there, and you've got to have a 2 in here, correct? No problem. And now, the pointer is going to get copied. C++ is not aware that high is out there. All it cares about, care about is the address inside S. So when the address inside S is copied into T, the result would be T pointing to the exact same place S is pointing, correct? Then it's going to print it. So it's going to say T print. It's going to actually print over here, hi, and go to new line. Life is beautiful down to this point, correct? Now, the function print with string will end. T is about to die. When T dies, the destructor is called. When the destructor is called, the memory is deleted, correct? So it, it deletes this, and it deletes the memory for it, correct? Now it comes out to main, and main ends. Now, the S inside main is about to die. It wants to die. It says, go to the location and d crash. It's already deleted. You are trying to delete something that is not yours anymore. When you delete a memory, it means it's not mine anymore. I give it back to operating system. So the address you have in the S is not yours anymore. It's someone else's now. And when it deletes, what happens? It crashes. Because of this fact, ladies and gentlemen, we need to always make sure classes who have data outside of their scopes to have the classes that have data outside of their scope, in our case for now, is dynamic memory allocation. We have to re-implement their copy routine. We have to tell the compiler, hey, you're copying? Don't. I tell you how to copy. And that we call a copy constructor. So what a copy constructor do, does, it actually works exactly like assignment operator. You see the assignment operator? It works exactly like that. But the difference is that it's a constructor. So essentially, I have to say string, and I'm going to say this string is initialized with another string's reference, s. Remember, you cannot not put a reference in here. If you don't put a reference, the chicken and the egg is going to happen, which means when copy constructor is called, it has to copy the string, but that needs to call the copy constructor that calls the copy constructor, which calls the copy constructor, which you don't know which one comes first, right? So because of that, you have to prevent copying, which means you have to say, my copy constructor always accepts a constant reference. So I'll sh I'm sure S is just a new name for an already existing out there, already existing string out there. And I'm not going to, okay, so what I'm going to do, how do I implement this? That's even simpler than that. It almost has a universal uh, implementation. So it is essentially string string again, constant string reference s. So what it does is essentially this. You see this set function? I'm just going to call that. First, I'm going to say set empty. Then I'm going to say, I don't need to check to see if anything is null or not, because that string exists. It means we are good, right? So, um, or I don't know, I, I, to just make your life easy, I'm just going to copy this and put it over here. 
not going to make it complicated. All I need to do is say over here, if s dot m data set that one to s dot m data, and, and then after this, set m size to s's m size. So instead of a blind copy, you do what we do, what we call a deep copy. It's not a shallow copy anymore. When the copying is happening, you tell the compiler, wait, don't do the copying, let me do the copying for you. So if I look at the process one more time and see now how it's going to get called, this is going to be the process. Now, take a look at this. I'm going to bring the set function up so we can actually see what happens over here for that set. I'm just going to bring it right under the copy constructor so we can walk through it. So now I'm going to do the walkthrough again. I know it's boring, but believe me, you need to have this. It's very important. And after this, you're going to go for a break. You deserve it, okay? Give me two seconds. Shall we go? Are we ready? Okay. So again, I'm not going to walk through that integer thingy anymore. We know what it is. I'm just going to do the, the, the string. So forget about that print with the val. It's only the string that I have with high. So we know that this string is created like this, and I have over here high, and I have null over here. And I know when print is called, I'm going to have over there a string called t that has a pointer and a value over there. OK? So what I'm going to do is this. When I walk through it, it comes through, and it says print s. So s wants to be passed by value to print. Because it's being passed by value, compiler says copy. As soon as the copy comes up, compiler takes a look. Did they implement the copy constructor? Yes, they did. I'm not going to do the copy. I'm going to follow their instructions. So it comes to line. So it comes to line. 20 instead. First, it's, so t is getting created, right? First, it's going to set t to empty, which we know it's going to be null over here and 0 over here, correct? Then it's going to say if s dot m data is not null. Now, s dot m data is not null. It's pointing to high, so it is not null. Therefore, if happens, it comes into set, passes m data to set, set first tries to clear the memory for t, which is already cleared, so nothing happens. Then it says over there, m size is str len of data. So m size of print will be str len of data that is 1, 2. So it puts 2 over here, correct? Right? Now, after it's putting 2 over there, then what does it do? Then it says m data is equal to new character m size plus 1. So it allocates memory with size of 3. Then it says copy the data that is actually s's data into print. So it's going to copy h, i, and make it null terminated. Then the if statement is over. It comes out of set, comes over there. It does m size again, because I forgot that I said it already. <laughs> so it's going to set m size to value of s as m size. So 2 will be overwritten again with 2. And that's why what, what walkthrough is good for. So essentially, I didn't need to do this. Right? And that's it. And now I have a fresh copy with its own memory. So it's going to print high because that's an exact copy. So in the output, high is going to get printed. And now print is over. T is about to die. The destructor of T is called. 
the memory of t will be deleted, and after that, t is going to get removed, and everything's good. My s remains intact, and everything's beautifully done. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was copy constructor. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Yes. A copy constructor sets an object to the values of an already existing object of the same kind. It, they are all setters. So, the so essentially, if you look at the code, really, the constructor, the copy constructor, and set are all the same thing. So essentially, the constructor and copy constructor is calling the set. But remember this golden rule. When you have dynamic memory allocation, two things are mandatory to get implemented with our knowledge at this point. Copy constructor and assignment operator. Because assignment operator does the exact same thing. If you don't set it, it's going to crash because they are both going to share the same memory when you set one to another. So again, golden rule, when you have dynamic memory allocation, two things have to get created, copy constructor and assignment operator. And from now on, we are not going to mention that to you. So whenever you see dynamic memory allocation, do the copy constructor and assignment operator. It's a must. Nobody needs to tell you that. If you don't do it, one copy is enough to crash your program. Are we OK? Break, five minutes, come back and we'll continue with helper functions. Something about memory allocation and deallocation, I have to tell you, and uh, I'll watch you do it because I, I hear some questions that uh, the concept of allocating and freeing memory is it, kind of blurry for some people. I want you to, to just uh, know exactly what it means. So when you issue like when, you're, when you double click on an icon and you run a program, or you write it in a command line and you run a program. When a program gets executed, you're essentially telling to the operating system, that's the file name for the executable, take it, put it in memory, and tell to CPU to run it. And that's what it does, the OS, the operating system. So essentially loads that file, the executable that you have, into memory, tells to the CPU, this is the beginning of the executable. Shoo, go. CPU goes through your execution and runs your program. Whatever you have inside that executable is yours. So any variable that you define, it's inside that executable. Any array that you create, it's inside that executable. Therefore, because your executable is in memory, that piece of variable is for you, free for you to use. Even if you have like five integers and, or, or an array of five integers and then an array of 10 integers, if you bypass the first five and you go to next, you just ruin your own executable. It's possible that OS won't even stop you because you're still in your own memory territory. The rest of the memory outside of this executable your executable sits, your executable is 5K. This 5 kilobyte of memory is in the RAM and it's working. Now, if you want any big chunk of memory outside of this executable, that's the new command. So when you actually say new, operating system goes somewhere else in the memory that sees it's free, it loans that, literally loans that piece of memory to you. So you become temporary owner of that piece of memory. So how does it do it? It tells you, it tells to the OS that this piece of memory belongs to that executable. And then it passes the address to your executable. So your executable can use that piece of memory that you loan. OS has no control over it. It's now your executable that is controlling that. Therefore, if you lose that address, it's like losing the key, not the key to your house, the address to your house, and you have Alzheimer's. You cannot find it. Finished. Done. You cannot find that house anymore. It's lost in a city. There is no way to find it. You have to go rent another one, buy another one. 
That's why it's so important for us to make sure that we take care of what is loaned to us. If we don't need it anymore, we free it. We say delete. We say to our operating system, hey, I'm done with that piece of memory. Take it back. Give it to someone else if you need to. And then you continue your work. That's essentially is DMA, dynamic memory allocation and management. That's it. There is nothing behind the scene. All the jumping up and down or dance around the code that we do accomplishes that. The copy constructor is essentially doing that. It's telling to the operating system, you see that piece of memory that I loaned? I want another piece of memory to the exact same size somewhere else, please. So I can copy this object of mine. And that's how things happen. Now, are we clear about what dynamic memory allocation is now? Hopefully, we're good. Hyperfunctions. The reason that I wanted to give you the copy constructor first, because if I wanted to actually because if I wanted to actually yeah, it's right here. Because if I wanted to actually uh, write you the helper function, I would have crashed my program because of this copy business. <laughs> so now I can actually give you an example of what a helper function is. So let's say I want to get two strings and build a new string out of these two and give it back to my program. If I want to do something like that, what the signature of that function is supposed to be? Again, as you see, my helper function is not a member of the class. It's outside. So I'm going to say this function of mine will return a string. It's called concat. And at left, um, the first argument is a string. I'm going to call it, and I'm going to make it a reference so I don't, and I'm going to make it a constant because I don't want to change it. Constant, I'm going to say over here s1, and const string reference s2. Okay, so now I have written the prototype for my helper function. I call it helper because it's not a member of my class. Now to implement it, I'll go to the file which I have all my string stuff set. I'll go over there and I'll actually implement it. So I'm going to say implement my uh, concat. Okay, I am... I am, create, I am returning a string, so I'm going to create a string over here. And I'm going to call it return. Okay? And I'm going to immediately set that one to S1. Assignment at the moment of creation is what? It's a call to a constructor, correct? What type of constructor is being called here? What is the argument of that assignment? It's another string, correct? So the copy constructor will be called. Therefore, return ret of mine becomes a copy of S1. Now to actually build my concatenation of S1 and S2, I already have plus equal operator over there created. So I'm going to say ret plus equal S2. So now ret becomes combination of S1 and S2 stick together, correct? Are we good with this? Now I'm going to say return ret. Now I have news for you. What is ret? ret is a local variable inside concat function. Is that correct? If ret is returned out, it's going to get destroyed because its scope is over, correct? So how can it actually, how can in my code I write something like this? So if I have a string s and I have a string t over here, Hello. 
and I have string u over here, and I'm going to say u is set to s is uh, set to concat of s and t. So that will call the function for concatenation, correct? So when the concatenation function is called, when the concatenation function is called, s will be s1, t will be s2, ret will get created as a new object, will be set to s1, s2 will be concatenated to ret, ret will be returned trying to go into u, correct? But it can't because it's just going to die. So how can any assignment function return be possible? If you are, this is something that we never think about it. We just tell you a function returns a value. But you never think about it. If I have a value inside the function and I'm returning it, and I know the scope of a function is the lifetime of that variable, how can it be returned when it dies before returning? The answer is that any value that is returned by any thing, any object, any variable that is returned by value will get copied, which means at line 86, at line 86, compiler will create a temporary nameless string that has no name and it copies ret into it. So that nameless string that has no name will have the exact same value as s, now as ret. So ret can die and gets deallocated. I have that nameless. Now that the function call is over, at right side of the assignment at line 19, I have the nameless object. At left, left side, I have u. Therefore, the assignment will happen. Again, another memory allocation setting and everything happens, and u becomes an exact copy of that nameless object. And nameless objects are doomed to die as soon as there are no use for them. So immediately after line 19, that nameless dies. I hope you are getting a message that how expensive it is to actually return something by value. For us, it's just returning. Who cares? How many copies that happen over there? How many dynamic memory allocations and free and a delete and a new and all those things? You always have to, if possible, try to pass things with reference as long as you can. In here, it was impossible. I cannot make that string a reference. Why? Because ret is about to die. I cannot return the name of a dying thing. I could return the reference of S1. That was fine. I could return the reference of S2. That was fine. But then that would ruin the whole logic of not changing S1 and S2. If I actually changed the S and made the thing over there, then everything like the whole business of concatenating of two values without changing their, their content will be ruined. So this I have to do. And that function is called the helper function. Are we OK with this? Now, helper functions can be written in many different ways. Like, for example, See, sometimes things are so wrong and against object orientation that teaching it becomes difficult. I have a question. What are friends good for? I always say this in my OP244 classes, and I see pe people's eyes are rolling. Okay? Friends in object orientation are good for knife in the back only. Why? I'll tell you why. You can make 
a helper function, friend of a class. So if I ever needed to change something in a string using that concat, if I ever needed to change S2 or S1, I could make this function of mine friend of a class. I could actually bring it in here. So copy that signature, put it in here, and say friend. By doing that, I could actually do something like this. I know it's stupid, but I could do it. I could actually, if it wasn't constant like this, I could come over here and change the content of S. Or let's actually do something like that, something else. Uh, to show you what I mean, oh, not that, not that. I'm just going to write a very quick helper function that doesn't make sense to tell you what's going on. So that's const. I'm going to go back in here. Let's say I wanted to do, let's say I wanted to do what this operator plus equal is doing, but using a friend function, using a helper function. So essentially, what I want to do, so let that be const. And I'm going to say over here. So this one, I'm not going to make it a friend because it just doesn't make sense. So I could do something like this. I could, I could say, I could say void add to. At left side, I'm going to put a string reference destination, like a string copy. At right side, I'm going to put uh, a constant string pointer source. And in my code, I would write this. So that's the function I want to write. And this we don't need. That's the function I want to write. So I'm going to come to my CPP file and add a standalone function. And in this function, I would say destination plus equal source, right? But there is one problem over here. Actually, uh, no, 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 not like that. Actually, write the code for it. So I'm going to come to the plus equal. So I'm going to write exactly what I had in plus equal in that function. So essentially, in here, I would do this. So <clears throat> in here, I'm going to say delete destination dot m data in here i'm going to say destination dot size in here i'm going to say source so as you see i am doing what the member function was supposed to do and i'm getting error messages everywhere because <clears throat> as you see all these values are private stuff that i'm not supposed to touch destination m data and destination, so and this one's source. <clears throat> so as you see, it's going cuckoo because it's telling, hey, you are trying to access all private stuff that you are not supposed to. I'm going to say, no problem. I can fix that. I'm just going to take this one and make it a friend of a class. And now if I come back over here, then everything is perfectly good. Uh, this is actually source dot. And so now it's perfectly OK. You know what it looks like? You gave your key to your drunk friend. And you went to a vacation. You come back, and you see something's lost in your house. Who's the thief? Your friend, even if, I, if you have lost it. That's the problem with friend methods. They can change inside class things. They can change the stuff inside the class without you knowing it, without the class being aware of it. And because of that fact, ruining everything. Friends should be avoided as much as you can. As you see, I can write a helper function 
without friendship if I have my class set up properly as you see over here. Whenever you need to write a friend function, remember, you, can, you have to see if you actually can convert it to a member function or create accessors inside your function that give you limited, give that function limited access to the private properties. Therefore, take control of outsiders changing stuff in your class. It doesn't look significant to you right now because mission accomplished, I made it a friend, but it works, right? It works perfectly like the other one. But the problem over here is that you will see later on when the design of the system becomes complicated, then you'll be in trouble. Then you're going to have a bug that you cannot find out how to fix because you don't know who is changing it. Remember, friends, knife in the back. Friends are OK, actually, in object orientation. We'll see it soon. I'll show it to you. You can make even classes friends of other classes. So I can have a class friend, a class being friend of another class. It means this class have full access to the properties of another class. You know what these things are? For example, you want to simulate an array. An array is an object that is created out of several elements, correct? Correct? Now, if you have a class element and you have a class array, it makes sense for the array to be friend of the element. Why? Because an element cannot exist without a, an array. Array has ownership over the element. Therefore, friends in object orientation are really ownership. It's exactly like everyone says, my dog is my friend. No, it's not. You can put it down tomorrow. Can't you? Just put it in like you call it nicely. Put it into sleep, right? No, you can kill the poor thing if you want to. So you're not its friend. You're its owner. And that's exactly what it is in object orientation. You give friendship to a class, it becomes fully owner of another class. And if that's the logic that you want to implement, then you're good to go. But just don't make it friendship because you're lazy to create an accessor function. OK? All right. Are we OK down to here? We have till 12.30, correct? All right. I know we have lots of information coming in today, but yes. it as a function that is going inside another function or we can't? No, it has nothing to do with that. A helper function is only a function that help you do stuff with your class. Now I'll tell you when you need to write a helper function. I'll show it to you. By going back to uh, operators. So because you are not confused enough, I'm going to actually talk about operators a little bit. And let me zoom in. All right, that's much better, actually. All right. So <clears throat> please take a look again. If I have full A, this is a question you're going to get for your quiz, OK, the next day that you're coming in. If I have foo A and I have fa B, OK? All right? Foo A, A and fa B and C, if I have something like this. If I have C is equal to A plus B, I will tell you, tell me what is the function call for the operators that you see over here. When something like this, just remember, operators are essentially overloads of already existing operators. So you have to treat them like regular operators. When you look at that thing, you have to say, OK, I have c is equal to a plus b. That is fine. So if it was integer, a plus b will happen first, right? So first you change that one. a plus b, we said it's going to be essentially Oops. 
it's going to be essentially a dot operator plus b, correct? And somebody's playing tempo somewhere. Anyways, and so this is done now, correct? Now I have to do that. What is that? That essentially is this being passed into operator assignment with C, correct? Therefore, the signature of plus operator will be who is the owner, who, what type of uh, object is A? A is foo, correct? So it's going to be foo, scope resolution, operator, plus, and here I don't know if it's constant, it is not, that I don't care, I want to know what is the type. What is the type of B? Fa, correct? So it's going to be fa something, I don't know, const, no const, I don't know. Fa, and then in here I'm going to have whatever, okay, some value. Now, it could be const, it could be reference, I don't know. And what is this one? I know for a fact it's operator equal, something is being passed to it, correct? And it belongs to C, and C is foo, right? What is being passed over here, you have to take a look at a source code. So you have to open up the class, take a look at the class. Where is operator plus for foo that accepts a vow? That, that, accept, that accepts a, oh, that's actually a fault. Oh, yeah. Where is the operator plus in food that accepts a fault? Then you see what is the output. So, for example, if the, uh, if the return statement of this one was fault, it could be reference, it could be const. We don't know. You have to check the code. Then that's going to be the op, uh, signature for uh, this operator. So, in here, I'm actually receiving a fault. Some, something is that far. I don't know what is that. So this is, I could be reference, could be const. So again, <clears throat> this is the summary of member operator variables. Don't scratch yourself on the thing. It's shaking everything, the camera. The camera is over there, you see? Don't shake the table. All right. Oh, are we okay with this? So that's how you recognize, yes. Pardon me? Mm-hmm. No, it can't, because when you look, take a look at plus. What is that left side of plus? A, correct? What is type of A? So foo is the owner. There is no way around it. When you have a binary operator and you are thinking about member binary operators, always the left side of the operator is the owner. There is no way around it, okay? When you are dealing with member operators, always the left one is the owner. Yes? Shouldn't the last one, operator equal, be because it belongs to fun? Oh, yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. Thank you. It is fun. That's, That's what you mean. Yeah, well, sorry about that. Yeah, it is fun. I made a mistake. It's not foo. Yeah. And we don't know what it returns. This is absolutely, we have no idea. It could be void. It could be whatever. This cannot be void. The plus cannot be void because it's being passed to an assignment. We have a left value over here. But this one, we have no idea what it returns. It could be void. It could be something else, anything. You have to go check the, the, the source for it. Are we okay with this? All right. As if that wasn't complicated enough. Seriously, this campus is amazing. First drilling, and now somebody's playing the drums. Yeah, and five minutes from now, we're going to have belly dancing. And <laughs> anyway, so I don't know. It's just crazy. OK, so <clears throat> operators, now listen to me carefully. 
operators, when you are overloading them, always prepare, always prefer to have it as member operators. Okay? Because we are doing object orientation, we do not like rogue standalone functions. If you are creating an operator, and the operator that you are creating, okay, cannot be a member, you can make a helper operator overload, which is essentially a helper function. So when I have, I'm going to just write something else. If I have foo A, fa B, and phi C, so I have three of those. It's phi, space, pause, C, okay? So now if I have something like this, if I write A is set to B plus C, I can do the analysis and make it member variables as we talked about it before. But it could have been, this operator could have been implemented as a helper function. How? This is how. A helper function works like this. You have operator, whatever the operator you want it to be, it doesn't matter. In here, you have left operand, whatever, comma, right operand. Oh, I went out of the screen. Okay. Comma, right operand. That returns something. I cannot write. Okay? Which means if I want to implement this, A is foo, right? It will be foo. returned by, so this B plus C is returning a foo, it is operator plus at left side is receiving B, which is fa, so left operand, at right side is receiving phi, right operand and the return type is foo. So this, as a helper function, can be developed as that one. We could do that. And I'll show you what good does it do. OK? So you could, and this is not member of any class, as you see. It's a standalone function. It's a helper function. 11, uh, 1230 we finished, right? OK, so what if I wanted to, instead of all these printing, sprinting stuff that I had over here, what if I wanted to actually print the string S like this? What if I wanted to say C out, S, or C out, S, and L? What if I wanted to print C out, print S with C out? What if I wanted to do that? Now, if I wanted to go by what we taught, we have to go, because we know C out is an instance of O stream, correct? If I had access to the class O stream, I could have done O go over there and create a member variable for O stream that accepts my string. We don't have access to that. So we have no access to the left operand. I have to write a helper function. There is no way around it. So what do I do in here? I'm going to say to do that, to accomplish that, I have to make that thing work, which means I need to at So, I, so the, the, this is the operator for it that I have to implement. As you see, it's being set over there. So I have to say operator. At left side, I have what? C out. That is O stream. So I'm going to write O stream. O stream 
reference, it cannot be a value, OS. And at right side is a string that I do not want to change. Const string reference S. So that becomes a thing. What does it return? If I want to be able to put this thing halfway through the C out chain, it has to return another C out. If I want to be able to C out something like this is T. If I want to do something like this, first C out, and this is is called, and the return value is another C out. Then that C out and T will be called, and the reason what, and the result should be another C out. So in the end, uh, end L can get printed. So as a result, I have to return an O stream reference to. So the implementation for it will be quite simple actually. The implementation for it would be like this. I know already S knows how to print itself, right? So I'm going to say s.print, and I'm going to say return OS, done. By doing this overload, simple overload, I am telling it, now you see, the error is gone. Now, any time the compiler sees a C out at left and my string is at right, it knows it has to come over here passes the string to here, calls the S print, it prints the, the string, returns the OS back for the next one to be, to be using it. So and L can get printed, and so on and so forth. Kind of, it's, it sinks into the chain reaction of things getting printed. That I'm going to go through again and show you exactly how it's done in detail. But it's something that you need to go through and study. So for the next day you are coming in, I want you to study all these. <laughs> Everything. You know, input output operators essentially what we have over here. Classes and resources, we went through it. Helper functions, we know what they are. I didn't cover everything, I know that. It's college. You have to go find out what I did not cover you come back next lecture with questions. But I want you to go through it. So what we're going to do for the rest of the sessions that we have is going through example after example after example to see how all these things are done in detail. But I need you to go over it. Today when I talked about strings, 80% of you went completely blank which means 80% of you did not review the string code that I put last time. You have to review the code that I had that I put you. I'm not going to post this now. I have to make sure there is no bug. I didn't execute it. I have to make sure everything's good and runs properly. Then I'll go through it. F10 and F11 are your friends. Pass through it and walk through it. Get a four-colored marker. Well, sorry, pen. Those big pens, you know, the four color ones, get one of those and draw exactly what happens on the, on the paper to understand how things are happening. You don't do that, you won't get it. Have yourself a beautiful day.